Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Welcome to the next uh, session of uh, the introduction to modern Indian theatre. For today, we will actually be uh, discussing another very important uh, playwright, Girish Gardner, 1938, and uh, he turns 80 this year. So, he is another very important uh, playwright. He also directed a few plays. Um, of his own plays and he is also very important because like many of his other contemporaries uh, including Badal Sarkar from Bengali, uh, Ibrahim al um, and uh, so on and so forth, B. V. Karanth, Alek Padamse. So he belonged to the first uh, generation of playwrights post-independence and many of his plays as he himself puts it had to do with the return to the cultural roots of theatre. They had to um, engage with this very complex negotiation between colonial forms of theatre and uh, indigenous folk traditions. So, in many of his plays, Girish Karnad is trying to grapple with this dilemma that many playwrights of his generation had, which was that what do we do with uh, the colonial legacy of theatre and to what extent can there be a conversation between colonial forms of theatre and uh, indigenous uh, theatre traditions. So as a playwright, as a dramatist, um, he drew a lot from local folk traditions, folk forms like the Tamasha, the Nautanki, as well as the Yakshagana. Uh, tradition of performance, which was prevalent in the uh, border regions of Maharashtra and uh, Karnataka. He was himself born in uh, Mataran, Bombay in uh, 1938, uh, which was then part of the Bombay Presidency. But um, even though he studied Marathi in school, uh, it was early Kannada that uh, was his major language of uh, expression. Uh, some of his plays, uh, especially the, the ones on uh, the dream of Tipu Sultan, were written in English, but most of his plays were written in Kannada and then translated uh, by him and by others uh, into English. So, uh, he is uh, important in some sense as one of those early figures, playwrights who um, belonged to uh, the theatre of roots movement. Um, he may not entirely identify with the movement himself, but there are elements in his plays that suggest that he um, wished to draw from or incorporate uh, certain elements of folk tradition or folk forms uh, in his own theatre uh, to very often introduce multiple uh, frameworks of theatre, multiple uh, narrative frameworks and uh, also in order to parody ironize uh, certain uh, ideals like uh, motherhood, like chastity, like fidelity, you know, like, um, you know, all these issues were in some sense parodied and ironized in his plays. So, uh, for instance, uh, if you look at his play on uh, Tughlaq, right, uh, which was uh, written and published in 1964, uh, again, he draws on the idealist uh, 14th century Sultan of Delhi. Muhammad bin Tughlaq, right, and that in some sense is also given a modernist twist. Uh, so it's interesting to see how he draws from older historical figures and recasts them in a modernist idiom to talk about the idealism and the disillusionment of the Nehruvian era uh, post-independence. 
then there was uh, this other very important play that we will be discussing today, which is Hayavadana, 1971, which was again based on a theme drawn from the uh, transposed heads, right? uh, which was initially, of course, a um, tale from the Katha Sarit Sagar, but was also then adapted uh, into a novella by the German writer Thomas Mann, which was called The Transposed Heads in 1940. So it was drew originally from the 11th century Sanskrit text Katha Sarit Sagar. And he also employed uh, the folk theatre form of Yakshagana in the Hayavadana play. Then you also had another play called Nagamandala 1988, which was based on a folk tale that was recounted to him by the writer and translator A.K. Ramanujan, who in some sense brought him the Karnataka Sahitya Academy Award for the most creative work of 1989. Uh, it was directed by J. Garland Wright as part of the celebrations of the 30th anniversary of the Guthri Theatre in Minneapolis. Then the theatre that was uh, subsequently commissioned to him was Agni Mattumale or The Fire and the Rain. Right? And before that came Tale Danda or Death by Beheading in 1990 which again uses Veera Shaivism and Basavanna, the great Veera Shaiva, anti-caste Veera Shaiva leader uh, and uh, poet who um, formed, uh, was a part of the radical protest and reform movement in 12th century Karnataka against uh, the caste system. He has won several awards including the Sangeet, Na Sangeet Natak Academy Award in 1972, the Padma Shri in 1974, the Padma Bhushan in 1992, the Kannada Sahitya Parishad in 1992, the Sahitya Academy in 94, the Nyanpeet in 98, the Kalidas Samman in 98 and so on. Right? So he's also been part of many, of, uh, you know, uh, acted in many movies and films in Kannada and Hindi and uh, he has also written uh, certain very important screenplays for films uh, like uh, Bhumika by Sham Benegal and Satyadev Dubey and uh, he has also written uh, scripts for certain important non-feature films in uh, Kannada. So now let us actually move to our discussion of Girish Karna's very important play uh, Yakshagana which, in, uh, which was imagined to be one of those paradigmatic uh, plays which incorporated folk elements uh, into urban theatre. Now, uh, it's interesting to look at Hayavadana in terms of its structure and form in the ways in which it deploys certain motifs like uh, the Lord Ganesha in the initial uh, phase of the play, in the initial moments of the play. Uh, it's also framed by uh, the a female chorus. You also have two anonymous actors. You have the Bhagavata who performs the role of the Sutradhar in uh, Girish Karnath's play Hayavadana. Uh, and you also have the central story of, of Padmini and her love for uh, two men, uh, uh, Devdatta and his friend Kapila. When you look at, uh, when you read, uh, if you've seen the performance of Havadana, uh, which was first performed in 1973, uh, or 71, sorry, um, it appears as if it is a rather traditional play that begins with uh, in, an invocation to the Lord Ganesha. Now, the story itself has to do with uh, the love that a woman has for two men, right? And in the Katha Sarit Sagar, the 11th century tale, there are slight differences between the tale, Thomas Mann's novelistic adaptation of the tale, and Girish Karnad's play, Hayavadana. In the Katha Sarit Sagar, uh, in the story that's called The Heads That Got Switched, it contains a very simple riddle. A woman is traveling with her husband and her brother when she discovers the men's decapitated bodies in the temple of Parvati. And she receives a boon from the goddess which will bring them back to life. But in the process of bringing them back to life, see, she switches the heads by mistake. So the resulting problem of true identity ends up having an unambiguous solution to this in this version. The one with the husband's head is the husband because the head rules the body and the person. So the personal identity depends on the head. In, and this of course draws from certain mythic 
uh, genealogies of caste which can be found in uh, Manu Dharma Smritis uh, and the Rig Veda where the Brahman or the Brahmins are said to have risen out of the Purusha's head, right, man's head while the Shudras arose from his feet. So the supremacy of the head over the body is established in the Katha Sarit Sagar in the tale called The Heads That Got Switched. In Thomas Mann's uh, elaboration of the story in his novella, The Transposed Heads in 1940, again there, is, there are three characters. The female protagonist Sita, ironically named Sita, is married to Sri Daman, who is a very intelligent, intellectual, uh, aesthetic, aesthetic uh, and sensitive man. But she also feels an intense physical attraction for Nanda, who is Sri Daman's friend, who is an emotionally crude and uh, strong man right, with a very fine physique. In the Thomas Mann version, the, uh, the husband, right, Sri Daman, uh, beheads himself in, the Par in Parvati's temple out of jealousy and despair because he realizes that his wife is actually deeply in love with uh, his friend. And the friend, out of guilt and fear, again uh, beheads himself when he discovers his friend's decapitated body and the pregnant wife, uh, Sita who is pregnant, prepares to die in order to avoid um, uh, ignominy, dishonor for herself and for the child. After the accident of the transposition of the heads, uh, a holy ascetic, uh, Grand Sita, the new Sridaman by using the same logic that appears in the folk tale. Right? But in Man's text, the supremacy of the head is sustained and challenged beyond the point of crisis. Right? So the new bodies of the two men uh, change inexorably until they are, in, they are compatible with their heads once again. Right? So the, the bodies of the two friends also change until they are compatible with their heads. So Sri Daman, who is an intellectual uh, aesthete, his head lies on Kapila's body, right? Uh, sorry, on um, uh, in this case on Nanda's body, and uh, Nanda's body soon loses its uh, athleticism, its physique, and becomes soft. While uh, the reverse happens with uh, Nanda's head, which is on Sri Daman's uh, delicate body, which acquires uh, musculature over time. So. The new bodies of the two men, they change irreversibly until they are compatible with the heads once again. But the original bodies also exert their own subversive power and change the heads indefinably. So Sita, to whom the man with the husband head and friend body has given, has given the full enjoyment of, of the pleasures, of sensual pleasure, for a time finds herself yearning once again for the, the, the friend who has Nanda's head and Sri Daman's body. And eventually, by the end of the novella, Sri Daman and Nanda kill each other in the forest, and Sita commits sati on the funeral pyre, leaving her four-year-old son behind to keep alive the memory of the strange sacrifice. Right? So this is what happens in Thomas Mann's uh, adaptation of the heads that got switched, a folk tale from the Katha Sarit Sagar. In uh, Karnat's play, you have uh, certain additional elements, uh, certain additional frames to the play, which uh, also deorientalizes uh, Thomas Mann's version of uh, the heads that got switched. Right? Because uh, in the heads that got in in the transpose heads, there is a certain fascination with sati as an oriental practice that testifies to the uh, wife's fidelity to her husband. So she punishes herself for actually uh, betraying her desire for another man, her husband's friend. In the Karnat play on Hayavadana, there is this additional element where you have the Bhagavata who is the narrator. Right? He's the narrator, he is the sutradhar of the play, he is resonates with some of the folk uh, sutradhars of folk plays. Who, uh, whose role is to very often step in, intervene in the action, uh, engage in a question and answer session with the characters who appear on stage. Right? And uh, in the production of Girish Karnad's Hayavadana, 
uh, masks were also used as um, you know, uh, which were actually drawn from certain folk traditions of theater, uh, Yakshagana and others, where masks were used. So you have, for example, Hayavadana himself, the main character, the eponymous character of the play, Hayavadana, who is a horse-headed uh, man, right? So he has the body of a human being, but he has the head of a horse. And he interrupts the story of the woman who fell in love with the two men, right? And in this case, the names are Padmini, and her husband is called Devadatta, and his friend is called Kapila. So you have Kapila, you have Devadatta, and you have Padmini. And the main story, the main plot of Padmini's love for these two men is interrupted early in the play by Hayavadana and his own story, his own past. And you also have an anonymous actor you also have a female chorus that constantly anticipates uh, the action of the play and uh, very often comments on it in a tragic fashion. And you also have the use of three dolls uh, in the actual uh, production, the first production of the play in 1973 and when the play was remounted in 1989. Uh, small children played the role of these dolls uh, and these dolls also wore masks and the purpose of these dolls was to actually um, externalize uh, the illicit desires and thoughts of Padmini as she's sleeping uh, when she begins to fantasize about uh, Kapila after the transposition. Right? So you have all these additional folk uh, elements that adds to the complexity, the layered complexity of the play. So. In uh, the Hayavadana, the play itself was, uh, was performed uh, initially in 1971 as a poster play for the emerging roots movement. It was uh, seen to be a new dramatic form which successfully incorporated folk elements into a modern urban theatre in an urban setting. Uh, in the uh, 1972 production by B. V. Karanth, uh, there was the uh, use of uh, certain uh, traditional performance elements from uh, Yakshagana, uh, which is a well-known genre of dance drama performed in Karnataka. And uh, there was a very interesting hybrid quality, quality to the play, which made it neither Indian nor exclusively Western. Right? In some sense, Karnat wasn't interested in trying to get rid of Western elements of, uh, of uh, theater but was also trying to incorporate certain folk elements to produce a play which could not be reduced to either of uh, it, these two categories of Western and Indian. In uh, Hayavadana, uh, the play focuses on, again on Padmini who is attracted to Kapila, uh, who is her very intellectual husband Devdatta's uh, friend. Right? And Kapila has an athletic physique and uh, he's also the son of a blacksmith. Padmini herself is the daughter of a merchant and Devdatta is a Brahmin. So there is already a, a prohibition on the possibility of Padmini marrying Kapila because that would count as, a, as an intercaste marriage. Right? So it's already forbidden and uh, so she marries Devdatta who is a Brahmin. And Devdatta who grows jealous of, uh, who discovers his wife's desire for Kapila grows jealous and cuts off his own head in front of the Kali temple. In fact, he even offers to, he promises to offer his head to Kali if at all he should acquire um, Padmini as his wife. Kapila later on finds his body and uh, he knows that he might be blamed for Devdatta's suicide uh, because of his own desire for Padmini and he ends up beheading himself too. And Padmini, who is again terrified of the gossip that will ensue, uh, because she's worried that the world might think that uh, the uh, that uh, the two men fought over a woman who was uh, of uh, um, uh, a sexually disreputable character ends up on being on, on the verge of killing herself, uh, you know, stabbing herself to death. But that is when uh, the goddess Kali intervenes and stops her from killing herself. Right? And uh, Padmini begs for the life of the two men and she ends up switching the heads of the two men uh, in her eagerness to bring them back to life. 
and so you have uh, she ends up with uh, Dev Datta, uh, husband's body being uh, transposed with uh, Kapila's head, while Kapila's body acquires Dev Datta's head. And she, of course, uh, the choice is easy to make initially, at least, that she ends up leaving with uh, Dev Datta's head and Kapila's body. Right. So she is she ends up with that hybrid combination of Dev Datta's head with Kapila's body, while uh, Kapila's head with Devdatta's body ends up uh, being rejected. And like in uh, the, uh, the Thomas Mann's uh, adaptation of the transpose heads, uh, Padmini uh, later on as, as time passes she realizes that um, her husband's body is growing soft. It has lost its, its athleticism because clearly his, uh, the head governs the body. Right? So he loses his athleticism and he uh, he is no longer attractive to his wife and she begins fantasizing about uh, Kapila uh, whose body has also undergone a muscular transformation, right? who has become uh, at the athletic the way he used to be. And there is also the predicament of the child because when Padmini is pregnant uh, with uh, her uh, son, uh, the, the question of paternity becomes uh, a, a riddle which cannot be answered. So. Um, is, did, did Devdatta's body produce the child or did Devdatta's mind uh, produce the child? Right? So it, it's not clear. Right? And, but the difference lies here that while Thomas Mann's novella right, uh, is a philosophical uh, rendition of the headset got switched, uh, Hayabadana places uh, this uh, debate, this dichotomy between mind and body. Uh, as a dichotomy between self and other. Right? So while in Thomas Mann there is a battle uh, reigns between, uh, I mean loss between uh, the head, the intellect and the body and its emotions, uh, in the Hayavadana the dichotomy between the opposition between mind and body is couched as a dichotomy between self and other which is placed within the social and political context of post-independence India. So the Bhagavata, who is the uh, Sutadhar of the play, the narrator or singer, uh, as he's about to introduce Padmini's story, he is interrupted by an actor who runs on stage yelling that he has just seen a talking horse right? and no one believes it. They are incredulous and they wonder how a horse can talk. The shocked actor uh, uh, swears that he saw a horse talking to him. Uh, which is when Hayavadana appears on stage and he has, he's wearing a horse's head or a horse's mask and a man's body. And they still don't believe that he is a hybrid cross between a horse and a man. And they try to remove the, what they think is a mask and they're unable to. And they realize that the mask is, actu is the actual real face. <laughs> I 
जैसी हो गई है इसे अच्छा क्यों सता है जब ये शरीर तुम्हें मिला था तो कितना कोमल है राजकुमार के शरीर की तरह ये पानी कितनी बस्ती और अभी ने देखो क्या बना रखा है तुम्हें अपना जब ये शरीर मुझे मिला था तब ये मेरे सिर से लटकती लाश की तरह था ब्राह्मण की इंजली दुर्बल काया जंगलों के लिए नहीं बनी दौड़ता तो घुटने दुखने लगते कुल्हाड़ी चलाता तो हाथ भाग जाते ये शरीर मेरे किसी काम का रखा फिर ये शरीर मुझे मिला उसी दिन मेरे और उसके बीच शुद्ध छट गया कौन जीता मैं <laughs> हमेशा मस्तक ही जीतता है ना हाँ पत्नी नहीं अभी से भाग ही समझो जब कोसों दौड़ सकता हूँ बरसाती बाढ़ में भी कूद कर तैर सकता हूँ बड़े से बड़ा पेड़ गिरा सकता हूँ पहले पेड़ साथ नहीं देता था मगर अब जो भी मिले पचा देता ना मिले तो भी रोता नहीं ये मैं कपिल ऐसा कपिल जिसका शरीर उसके मस्तक से बेल खाता है कपिल देवदत्त कपिल दे ही देवदत्त देवदत्त शरीर ही कपिल जन्म में पुरुष चाह तुम उसे क्यों छोड़ आई तुम्हें कैसे समझाऊ तुम यहां क्यों आई तुम्हें देख ही नहीं क्यों जब मैं अपने आप से जूझते जूझते ही समझ बैठा था कि मैं जीत गया हूं तब तुम क्यों यहां आए मैं जैसे तैसे करके उन यादव को मिटा सका रहा तो क्यों तुमने मेरा पीछा किया कपिल हूं जंगली बेरहम कपिल अपने जा जहां मत मिला चली जाओ देवदत्त के पास वही तुम्हारा पति है इस बच्चे का पाप देवदत्त और पत्नी देवदत्त और पत्नी अग्नि की साक्षी से बंदी जोड़ी जहां मेरी कोई जगह नहीं कोई शांति नहीं कोई मुक्ति नहीं मैं कहता हूं
और सहसा मैंने दो तीन कविताएं भी घसी डाली <laughs> बेशकीन निकम्मी थी अगर आप मुझे उन सबसे घृणा है अरे शकीन मैं तुम्हारा बल चाहूँ शकली पर नहीं तुम घृणा में जिए और मैं है मैं तो मैच गया बदला बदली हेरा फेरी बोल बता दे कौन हारा एक बात बताओ पूछो क्या तुम सचमुच पर मिलने पर चाहते हो
जंगल के शिकारियों से पूछो तो वे जंगल के बीच एक हरा भरा सुहाग के फूलों का वृक्ष बनाते story offers another perspective on the divided self right, which frames the central plot of the play by appearing both at the beginning and at the end of the play. Hayabadana is trying to unite his body and his head and this dilemma between the body and the head is expressed in terms of nationalism and Indianization which is why uh, uh, Hayabadana says initially um, I took an interest in the social life of the nation, civics, politics, patriotism, nationalism, Indianization and the socialist pattern of society. Right? That, that's what he tells the Bhagavata. But where is my society? Where? You must help me become a complete man. So by the end of the play, Hayavadana is desperate to become a complete person. Right? And uh, of course he then chooses to, to transform himself entirely into a horse but he's unable to actually lose his voice. So even though he's almost able to transform himself into a horse, he's unable to use, lose his voice. And his voice by the end of the play is also silenced and stifled. All he can do by the end of the play is to recite the national anthem. And this again becomes a, a remark on the politics of nationalism, the exclusionary politics of nationalism, and the deep sense of disillusionment that, uh, that the youth uh, feel, the once idealistic youth of pre-independence India feel uh, post-independence. So the entire romanticism of the freedom movement is lost once independence is won and once reality strikes. So the Hayavadana is himself uh, the child of a princess and a celestial being who takes the form of a horse who then uh, after 15 years of marriage is miraculously transformed back into his celestial form. So he is the prod a, a, a product of miscegenation of this cross uh, species uh, breeding between a princess and a horse. And he comes from two worlds, two different worlds. 
human and animal, but he feels like he belongs to neither of these two worlds. So he again represents the divided self of the post-colonial subject, a character who is attempting to try and decolonize his own mind. So he tries to invent himself as a fully Indian subject by participating in the most simple demonstration of patriotism, which is to appear at the end of Act 2, where he manages to become a full horse, but still has a human voice, which uh, he's trying to lose by singing patriotic songs like Mande Mataram, uh, or Sare Jahan Se Achha, or Janda, or Jana Ganamana. So Havadana is a very comic figure, right? And he's a foil to the more tragic Devdatta and Kapila, whose inability to deal with their own head body divide leads to their deaths. Another interesting frame element, folk element in the play is also the deity Ganesha. So even though the play is initially an invocation to the god Ganesha, he just appears as he would uh, during these invocatory pujas. Right? So there is uh, the audience gets a darshan of Ganesha initially in the play, but uh, it's not clear whether Ganesha is really a god, does he play a god on stage, right? Is the audience supposed led to believe that he is a god on stage or is he merely just an idol, just a figure, right? Which invokes, uh, 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 you know, um, divinity, but is not really a part of uh, any ritual process, right? So he, it's not like as though Puja is being performed before Ganesha, even if he is being invoked in order to bless the performance of the play. And it's interesting that uh, Girish Karnat should have introduced Ganesha in the play because Ganesha himself is, the, is a hybrid product. If you remember how Ganesha is formed, he's formed when uh, from uh, sandalwood paste that Parvati smears on her body, right? And uh, she molds the paste in the form of a young boy who then becomes her son and he is given the responsibility of guarding the entrance to her quarters as she's having a bath. And when Lord Shiva appears uh, to meet his wife, um, uh, he, uh, his uh, Ganesha refuses to let him enter, right? I mean, on the strict orders of his mother. but. Uh, uh, Shiva is enraged, wondering who this impertinent boy is to interrupt or to come in between him and his, and his consort. And he ends up beheading Ganesha, uh, much to the rage uh, of uh, his mother. And finally, uh, Shiva has no choice but to place the head of the first living being that his followers encounter in their process of trying to find a new head for Ganesha. And of course, they find an elephant they behead the elephant and they place the elephant's head on Ganesha. And it's interesting that Ganesha is also being worshipped today as a hybrid product, not as a human being, but as a hybrid product, something, someone who, who rises above his uh, physical identity as a human being or as a, an elephant. So he's, he's being acknowledged as a hybrid. So the initial invocations of uh, to Ganesha in the play Hayavadana suggest that the irony of uh, Ganesha, that in some sense Ganesha is, uh, I mean, he is believed to be on one hand the god, the god of, uh, of completion, of perfection. He is an auspicious god uh, who uh, is a remover of obstacles to, uh, to any uh, new uh, task that has to be accomplished. And yet he is himself imperfect. He has one broken tusk and he sits on a mouse and he is decorated with a snake. And so the Bhagavata, who is commenting on the placing of Ganesha at the beginning of the play, is not able to understand how is it that someone who looks incomplete can be the god of completion, of perfection. And he tries to rationalize that by saying that perhaps it's the limitation of human knowledge itself that doesn't allow us to understand the uh, the mystery, the, uh, uh, the power of, uh, of divinity, of, of Ganesha. So in the beginning of the play, Hayavadana recounts his own past as the product of uh, a princess and a celestial being who takes the form of a horse. 
um, and then uh, ultimately when the princess is married to the white stallion she lives with him for 15 years and it's only after that that the celestial being assumes reassumes his original form and after he's released from his curse uh, uh, the Hayavadana's father asks his mother to accompany him to his heavenly abode but she refuses and she offers to come to the to heaven with him only if she becomes a, only if she's blessed to become a horse if he becomes a horse again right because she's only love she's only in love with the horse and not with the the man right and so he curses her to turn into a horse so the princess herself turns into a horse and she escapes she runs away and so the child is only left behind and in a rather humorous conversation with the bhagavata uh, hayavadana uh, again girish karna is also trying to poke fun at the pieties of not only nationalism but also of religion and hinduism because hayavadana tries to uh, seek uh, redemption from various holy uh, hindu holy places like banaras rameshwaram gokarn haridwar gaya kedarnath and so on and is not able to find any kind of redemption uh, purification from these different places uh, because he's unable to actually uh, transform himself completely into a human being or a horse right so he's condemned to remain in that uh, hybrid uh, state as half horse and half half man then the play recounts the story of uh, padmini and her love for the two men and how in her love for the two men she accidentally uh, ends up transposing the heads of kapila and devdatta right so unlike many of the urban realist plays that we see in uh, uh, you know el kanchwar mahesh el kanchwar or uh, others um, here vijay vijay tendulkar for example here uh, because kannad employs Uh, many folk elements there is the possibility of making fun of or parodying uh, certain uh, pieties certain social and sexual norms like motherhood and uh, female chastity right so the supposedly accidental transposing of the heads of the two men would suggest that uh, padmini the woman here uh, desires both right so it's um, it, it's the, the 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 her desire for the two men is also left Uh, uh rather clear and ambiguous it's betrayed uh it's suggested in a later in the sec first second act when the two when the three dolls end up externalizing padmini's own sexual fantasies and thoughts and her longing for uh, kapila the female chorus also anticipates the illicit des- desire that padmini has for kapila so uh, the female chorus sings um why should love stick to the sap of a single body when the stem is drunk with the thick yearning of the many petaled many flowered lantana why should it be tied down to the relation of a single flower and later on the female chorus again sings a head for each breast a pupil for each eye a side for each arm i have neither regret nor shame the blood pours into the earth and a song branches out in the sky again anticipating uh, padmini's illicit desire for kapila and the dilemma that she faces as a married woman who desires another man so later on in the play when devdatta recounts his encounter with this gorgeous woman called padmini he is unable to describe his beauty except in very conventional metaphors uh, drawn from sanskrit uh, erotic literature and poetry uh, com- often com- compares her to a lotus uh of course the kannada is also trying to make fun of this this the conventions of sanskrit uh, poet, poetry when uh, kapila is uh, echoes and repeats and uh, and you know anticipates devdatta's similes and metaphors to describe uh, padmini's beauty so for example he says a uh, devdatta is known to be a poet to be an aesthete but then clearly it's his poetry is not authentic or original he seems to be uh Uh, imitating uh, earlier classical poetry how can i describe her devdatta says to kapila her forelocks rival the bees her face is and this is all very familiar to kapila and he joins in with great with great enjoyment they both repeat together is a white lotus her beauty is as the magic lake her arms are lotus creepers her breasts are golden urns and her waist and so on and so forth Devdatta is desperate to identify and find Padmini and ask for her hand 
but he's, he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to identify her. He doesn't have the courage to find her. So he actually sends Kapila to find her. And Kapila is more than willing to do anything for Devdatta out of his own loyalty and love for Devdatta. So when Kapila uh, identifies Padmini's house on a street called the Pavanavidi, right, the street of merchants, right, he finds a double-headed bird on the door of Padmini's house. And he's not able to identify what bird it is. No matter how much he peers at it, he doesn't know whether it's an eagle or a lotus or a lion or a tiger right, or a wheel. He is completely perplexed by the shape and form of the knob on the door. Padmini enters and what ensues is a rather funny conversation that is resonates with certain Nautanki traditions or where uh, the woman in the Nautanki play is outwitted. But here, it's slightly different because you have a similar uh, fast exchange between Kapila and Padmini, but here Padmini uh, proves to be a very witty woman, unlike her rather uh, unoriginal and uh, uh, husband, Devdatta. So when Kapila first sees Padmini, he falls in love with her beauty. And he says, um, I give up Devdatta. This is, he's talking to himself. I surrender to your judgment. I hadn't thought anyone could be more beautiful than the wench Ragini who acts Ramba in our village troop. But this one, you're right. She is Yakshini, Shakuntala, Urveshi, Indumati, all rolled into one. Padmini says, you knocked, didn't you? Kapila, uh, yes. Padmini, then why are you gaping at me? What do you want? Kapila, I, I just want to know whose house this was. Padmini, whose house do you want? Kapila, this one. Padmini, I see. Then who do you want here? Kapila, the master. Padmini, do you know his name? Kapila, no. Padmini, have you met him? Kapila, no. Padmini, have you seen him? Kapila, no. And this is an interesting reversal of what actually happens in the Nautanki where it's the woman who's constantly saying no to a man who's not a husband, who is trying to make uh, amorous overtures to her and is trying to make love to her and ends up saying no when she, or when she actually means yes, or, or, or ends up saying yes when she actually ends up, when she actually means no. But so here it's just a, a direct re a reversal when to Padmini's questions, Kapili of, of, uh, Kapila all constantly says no, no, until he actually means yes. Uh, Padmini, so you haven't met him, seen him or known him. What do you want with him? Kapila, aside to himself, she is quite right. What, what have I to do with him? I only want to find out his name. Padmini, are you sure you want this house or were you Kapila? No, I'm sure this is the one. Padmini, pointing to her head, are you all right here? Kapila, taken aback, yes, I think so. Padmini, how about your eyes? Do they work probably, properly? Kapila, yes. Padmini, showing him four fingers, how many? Kapila, four. Padmini, correct. So there's nothing wrong with your eyes. As for the other thing, I'll have to take you on trust. Well then, if you're sure you wanted this house, why were you peering at all those doors? And what were you mumbling under your breath? Right? So, and finally, of course, Kapila, uh, Kapila has no choice but to tell him that he is here on behalf of his friend Devadatta, which is when Padmini uh, discovers the real reason for why he's here, and she runs away bashfully because she realizes that he has come on behalf of his, fr of his friend to ask for a hand in marriage. The Bhagavata as the Sutra of the play always appears at moments in the play when it's not possible for the characters themselves to express or speak. Right? So there's a point when after the match has been made between Padmini and uh, Devdatta, the Bhagavata steps in to say that this could only have been the most logical and natural conclusion, right? Because this is the only way in which a marriage would have been possible because Padmini could never have been, never have married Kapila, who was the son of a blacksmith, right? So uh, a, a, a legitimate union would be between Padmini, the daughter of a merchant, and uh, Devdatta, who is a Brahmin. Need one explain to a wise and knowing audience what followed next? Padmini is the daughter of the leading merchant in Dharmapura. In her house, the very floor is swept by the goddess of wealth. In Devdatta's house, 
they have the goddess of learning from maid what could then possibly stand in the way of bringing the families together padmini became the better half of devdatta and settled in his house nor did devdatta forget his debt to kapila the old friendship flourished as before devdatta padmini kapila to the admiring citizens of dharmapura rama sita and lakshmana right so it seems as though kapila has been reduced to the status of a brother in law then they decide to go on a trip to the kali temple but devdatta is very reluctant to uh, go on a trip with kapila because he's not he's unable to find any time alone with his wife because kapila is always with them he's always intervening he's always interrupting he always wants their company so he's trying to get rid of kapila despite the fact that he loves kapila as his own friend and at this point in the play padmini is already pregnant right, expecting their first child so they decide to go to the ujjain fair on a bullock cart and on the way they stop at a temple the road the journey to the uh, fair is on a very uh, bad road right? there are lots of potholes and rocks and uh, they have to stop because padmini is pregnant and they worried about her health and the health of the child and they stop in front of a temple on the journey padmini uh, admires uh, devdatta as he uh, rides the cart he also looks at she also admires his muscles uh, much to devdatta's own jealousy uh, when he when she asks him to bring her a flower that they discover on the way it's called the fortunate lady's flower it's a beautiful flower that padmini wants and she asks um, kapila to climb the tree and bring her those flowers and that is when she ends up admiring his physique and devdatta who is jealous at the sight of her, his wife's desire for kapila uh, decides to um, give up his life now it seems as though uh, devdatta wants to give up his life because he had promised to offer his head uh, to the goddess kali if ever padmini were to become his wife but it also becomes clear that it's it's being done out of sheer insecurity and jealousy so he says to addressing uh, the goddess he says that give me strength in fact it's it's uh, it's a tem- it's a temple to uh, goddess kali and he he prostrates himself before the goddess and he says bhavani bhairavi kali durga mahamaya mother of all nature i had forgotten my promise to you forgive me mother you fulfill the deepest craving of my life you gave me padmini and i forgot my word forgive me for i'm here now to carry out my promise so all the characters seem to in some sense uh, conceal their true intentions for what they do and what and the and what they apparently seem to be doing what they apparently seem to be saying or claiming does not match with their own unconscious secret insecurities and jealousies and desires great indeed is your mercy even in this lonely place some devotee of yours a hunter a hunter perhaps or a tribesman has left this weapon who knows how many lives this weapon has sacrificed to you and so saying that he beheads himself with a sword and uh, padmini and kapila are waiting for him and after a while they they begin to wonder where he is and they and uh, she sends kapila to go in search of him and kapila goes and when he discovers that uh, that uh, his friend has beheaded himself he is uh, very very upset and and laments the loss of his dear friend and then he realizes that he would have to behead himself uh, to uh, spare himself from the uh, society's uh, censure and criticism he says you, you've cut off your head you've cut off your head oh my dear friend my dear brother what have you done were you so angry with me did you feel such contempt for me such abhorrence and in your anger you forgot that i was ready to die for you so i think kapila already knows that perhaps devdatta was resentful of uh, and jealous of the fact that uh, his wife desired kapila more than him and in your anger you forgot that i was ready to die for you if you had asked me to jump into fire i would have done it if you had asked me to leave the country i would have done it if you had asked me to go and drown in a river i would have accepted did you despise me so much that you couldn't ask me that i did wrong but you know i don't have the intelligence to know what else i should have done i couldn't think and so you've pushed me away no devdatta i can't live without you i can't breathe without you devdatta my brother my guru my friend you spawned me in this world 
accept me as your brother at least in the next here friend here i come as always i follow in your footsteps and he cuts off his head now meanwhile padmi is again wondering what happened to to kapila too she goes in search of the two men and by which time it is dark and she's unable to see clearly and she stumbles on the two bodies and she again is lamentful of the two bodies that she see and she had as another courage to behead herself but she tries to stab herself when the goddess kali interrupts now the voice of kali is not the voice of uh, hinduism right uh, it's it's not as though kali is again being represented as uh, a figure of piety right again she's a very uh, it's it's more a parody of uh, the idea of kali than the goddess herself the voice says hey and padmini freezes put it down put down that sword padmini who's that who's that and there's a tremendous noise of drums after which padmini shuts her eyes in terror right now uh, like uh, another very important element uh, that garnard incorporates from folk drama is the curtain right so a curtain is lowered on stage and taken away um, to introduce the figure of kali and there is a huge terrifying figure with her arms stretched out her mouth wide open with her tongue lolling out the drums stop and the goddess drops her arms and shuts her mouth it becomes clear that she has been yawning and this is exactly what the stage direction say to parody to make fun of the uh, solemnity the fierce ferocity of uh, kali kali completes the yawn saying all right open your eyes and be quick don't waste time Padmini says, "Mother, Kali, Kali, who's sleepy, says, 'Yes, it's me. There was a time many years ago when, at this hour, they would have the Mangalarti. The devotees used to make a deafening racket with drums and conch shells and cymbals. So I used to be wide awake around now. I've lost the habit. Right? So it's almost as if she couldn't care less. Now times have changed in the modern in the modern era. No one bothers with rituals, daily rituals, uh, religious pieties." and so now she seems to be absolutely uh, uh bored uh, it's almost like a, a very secularized uh, version of the goddess uh, making fun of uh, of hindu piety and piety itself um save me mother padmini says kali says i know i've done that already and padmini wonders why the goddess did not prevent the killings of the suicides of the two men right why didn't she stop them and kali says um uh, put these heads back on and once they attached properly they will come back to life and of course padmini betrays her desire for the two men and in the excitement of bringing them back to life ends up transposing the two heads and when padmini wonders why kali did not stop the two beheadings kali says the rascals they were lying to the last breaths so again kali's voice is there to actually expose the hypocrisy the pretense of these two men who pretend to make uh these large uh claims of piety and sacrifice but um, actually end up uh, uh revealing how insecure they were over their desire and love for padmini the rascals they were lying to their last breaths that fellow devdatta he had once promised his head to rudra and his arms to me think of it head to him and arms to me then because you insisted on going to the, to the rudra temple he comes here and offers his head nobly to wants to keep his word he says no other reason then this kapila died right in front of me but for his friend mind you didn't even have the courtesy courtesy to refer to me and what lies says he's dying for friendship he must have known perfectly well he would be accused of killing devdatta for you do you think he wouldn't have grabbed you if it hadn't been for that fear but till his last breath oh my friend my dear brother only you spoke the truth So it's interesting that the, the goddess says that Devdatta actually wanted to sacrifice his head to Rudra and his arms to Kali, and wasn't really interested. He wasn't really uh, devoted to Kali herself. Kapila was really more interested in sacrificing his life to save himself from social stigma, from the accusations of having loved another man's wife, and also because of his love for his friend, uh, ends up uh, offering his own head. So neither of them actually seems to have any devotion for Kali. and padmini apparently is the only one who is being true to herself 
not only to the goddess but to herself by betraying the fact that she desires both the men. Padmini says, it's all your grace, mother. Kali says, don't drag me into it. I had nothing to do with it. You spoke the truth because you're selfish. That's all. Right? So she's selfish because she wants both the men. Right? And she's true. She is true that she is. She, she confesses that, yes, she wants both. So Padmini is uh, initially the three, the, the three characters when they, when they come back to life uh, after the transposition. They're all excited and happy and, and, and they laugh over the fact that they've exchanged heads. But then over time they realize what's happened and Padmini ends up uh, walking away with choosing uh, uh, the man with Devdatta's head and Kapila's body because she has the best of both worlds. So they actually actually ends up um, uh, uh, leaving with him, leaving uh, the body with uh, Devdatta's head and uh, Kapila's body behind. There's again a huge dilemma on who is the father of the child, who is the actual husband. Is it the body, the hand that held uh, Padmini's hand in marriage, or is it the uh, the head of Devdatta, uh, which uh, loved her because of um, his poetic abilities? Uh, so, who exactly is the, the the lawful husband, and who is the lawful father of the unborn child? Is it the one, the man, the father with the body, or the father with the mind? And there is no clear resolution to this answer at this point in the play. As time progresses the mind begins to influence the body, right? So Devdatta, um, um, you know, initially uh, indulges, engages in, in, in the gymnasium in wrestling, right? Which is something he's never done before because he has a strong body. But that also changes because the body begins to uh, exert its influence on the mind and he uh, begins to actually lose uh, his musculature. You also see a transformation in Padmini's desire for Devdatta because Padmini begins to miss uh, the uh, manly masculine scent of his body, as in Kapila's body. But then uh, Devdatta has been using, he claims that he's been using sandal oil since he was a child. And Padmini says, um, I don't mean that. Your body had that strong male smell before and I liked it. But when we came back from the temple of Kali, you used to smell so manly. So why have you basically started applying sandal oil when I missed that unwashed smell, which is the smell that reminds her of Kapila, right? the unwashed, sweaty smell of Kapila. And at this point, you have the three dolls who appear uh, as a way of trying to uh, dramatize the inner desires, the forbidden inner desires of Padmini. So the dolls are, uh, in some sense, dramatizing these illicit proscribed desire within uh, the head of a of, of married woman uh, and they're also very gossipy and judgmental uh, dolls right? who constantly uh, judge uh, Padmini and uh, her son for um, being extremely um, deceptive and manipulative. Not a bad house I would say, doll one, not a bad house I would say, doll two, could have been worse. I was a little worried. Doll one, this is the least we deserved. Actually, we should have got a palace, a real palace. Doll two, and a prince to play with, a real prince. Doll one, how the children looked at us at the fair, how their eyes glowed. Doll two, how their mothers stared at us, how their mouths watered. Doll two, how their mothers stared at us, how their mouths watered. Doll one, only those beastly men turned up their noses. Expensive, too expensive. Doll two, presuming to judge us. Who do they think they are? Doll one, only a prince would be worthy, worthy of us. Doll two, we should be dusted every day. Do doll one, dressed in silk. Doll two, seated on a cushioned shelf. Doll one, given new clothes every week. Doll two, if the doll maker had any sense, he'd never have sold us. Doll one, if he had any brains, he should never have given us to this man. Doll two, with his rough laborer's hands. Of course, uh, referring to uh, Kapila's hands, which are on Devdat's uh, body. Then you also have, uh, again on uh, page 158, the ways in which the dolls actually echo uh, Padmini's uh, illicit uh, fantasies for Kapila. It says, um, Devdatta goes to doll one, moves it aside and picks up the book. Doll one shudders. Doll two asks, why? What happened? Doll one, he touched me and doll two, yes. Doll one, his palms, they were so rough once when he first brought us here. 
like a laborer's, but now they are soft, sickly soft, like a young girl's. So the doll's function is also to register the transformation in the body of Devdatta, who is now losing his rough bruteness uh, and has acquired uh, the soft, effeminate body of an intellectual Brahmin. Doll 2, I know, I've noticed something too. Doll 1, what? Doll 2, his stomach. It was so tight and muscular. Now, doll 1, I know, it's soft and loose. Doll 2, do you think it will swell up too? Doll 1, holding its hands in front of its stomach to suggest a swollen belly. It will swell a little. Doll 2, holding its hands a little further in front. Then more. Doll 1, even further. More and doll 2, even further. And more until doll 1, if it's a woman, doll 2, there'll be a child. Doll 1, and if it's a man, doll 2, bang. They roll with laughter. So it's suggesting the, registering the, transform the bodily transformation in Devdatta but it's also suggesting Padmini's uh, growing dislike or distaste for Devdatta's uh, increasingly, uh, you know, body that's, that's, that's quickly losing its, its uh, definition. A continuation of that fantasy, doll one, hey. Doll two, yes. Doll one, look. Doll two, where? Doll one, behind her eyelids, she's dreaming. Doll two, I don't see anything. Doll one, it's still hazy, hasn't started yet. Do you see it now? Doll 2, eagerly? Yes, yes. Doll 1, a man. Doll 2, but not a husband. Doll 1, no, someone else. Doll 2, is this the one who came last night? Doll 1, yes, the same. But I couldn't see his face then. Doll 2, you can now. Not very nice, rough, like a laborer's. But he's got a nice body, looks soft. Doll 1, who do you think it is? Doll 2, I, it's fading. Remember the face, doll one, it's fading. Oh, it's gone, doll two, and she wouldn't even remember it tomorrow, and so on. That is Padmini's longing for Kapila. But what she tells Devdatta is something very different. She says, what are you afraid of Devdatta? What does it matter that you're going soft again, that you're losing your muscles? I'm not going to be stupid again. Kapila has gone out of my life forever. I won't let him come back again. Kapila, what could he be doing now? And this is to herself. Where could he be? Could his body be fair still and his face dark? Devdata changes, Kapila changes, and me. So while the two men seem to change right, uh, in their respective ways, Padmini doesn't seem to change because she, she still desires Kapila throughout the play. Padmini uh, decides to take her son out uh, on uh, a trip to the forest and uh, that is where they uh, discover Kapila after a long time. And here again, Padmini is unable to actually acknowledge her desire for Kapila openly because she's a married woman and uh, the Bhagavata steps in to actually speak for Padmini. She, he takes on Padmini's perspective and when Kapila asks Padmini, that why have you moved away from Devdatta? Why have you come here? And uh, Bhagavata says uh, on Padmini's behalf, how could I make you understand? If Devdatta had changed overnight and had gone back to his original form, I would have forgotten you completely. But that's not how it happened. He changed day by day, inch by inch, hair by hair, like the trickling sand, like the water filling the pot. And as I saw him change, I couldn't get rid of you. That's what Padmani must tell Kapila. She should say more without concealing anything. Kapila, if that Rishi had given me to you, would I have gone back to Devdatta someday exactly like this? But she doesn't say anything. She remains silent. Right? So she is remains silent. She's not very sure. Her desire for the two men remains and it's not very clear uh, what would have happened if the reverse had happened. If she had chosen the body with Kapila's head, and Devdatta's body, what would have happened? So the two men remain substitutable. They remain substitutes. They remain interchangeable to each other for Padmini's desire. You also see the influence that the body has on the mind. Right? So when, when Kapila says, uh, this body is mine, right? she says he talks about his own body, Devdatta's body, which has been transformed by his hard labor. He talks about the memories that his body has, the body of his Devdatta's body bears the memories of Padmini's touch.
So, he says, one beats the body into shape, but one can't beat away the memories trapped in it. Isn't that surprising that the body should have its own ghosts, its own secrets, memories of touch, memories of a touch, memories of a body swaying in these arms, of a warm skin against this palm, memories which one cannot recognize, cannot understand, cannot even name because this head wasn't there when they happened. So, the body isn't subordinate to the head, it also seems to have its own autonomous life, its own bodily memory. Right? So, the body can remember the touch of Padmini, but the head cannot. And later on, when uh, Devdutta and Kapila meet, uh, they realize that they have both been transformed by their heads and their bodies. They almost begin to resemble each other, but then they realize that they have betrayed each other they are not able to live with each other in themselves. Right? So, Kapila is not able to uh, bear the fact that he has Devdutta's body and Devdutta is not able to bear the fact that he has Kapila's body and that they have both been transformed by the transposition and the fact that they both desire Padmini and Padmini desires both of them. So, it is not possible for them to live together. Right? Uh, so, they end up having a fight, a duel in which they end up killing each other. So, they are unable to actually reconcile the dilemma between head and body and they end up killing each other and Padmini herself burns herself on the funeral pyre by committing Sati. But since Sati is traditionally meant to be performed by the faithful wife of a man who has, who has died, a woman who, who proclaims or claims her fidelity to her husband, here the Sati is Padmini who is committing a sati for the two men, both of whom she loved and desired. Thus, the Bhagavata says, thus Padmini became a sati. India is known for its Pativratas, wives who dedicated their whole existence to the service of their husbands, but it would not be an exaggeration to say that no Pativrata went in the way Padmini did, and yet no one knows the spot where she performed sati. If you ask the hunting tribes that dwell in these forests, they only point to a full blossomed tree of the fortunate lady. It is the same flower, the same flowering tree that uh, Padmini had admired earlier on their trip to the Ujjain fair and when she asks uh, Kapila to bring her the flower from the tree. They say that even now on full moon and on new moon nights, a song rises from the roots of the tree and fills the whole forest like a fragrance. So, in some sense, this is also a satire, uh, a parody of the very ritual of Sati, which is meant to be con uh, conducted, performed by a wife who is faithful to her only husband. And the play is framed, as I mentioned earlier, by Hayavadana's uh, uh, predicament as a symbol of the post-colonial subject, uh, where again he is reappears towards the end of the uh, play, uh, 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 desperately uh, trying to get rid of all uh, human signs. Uh, so, he is not able to get rid of his voice and he can only use his voice to uh, sing uh, the national anthem. They are also left with uh, Padmini's son who has been abandoned and orphaned by the death of his parents. And uh, the, the predicament of the son is also like, like the predicament of Hayabadana because uh, he, uh, he is also the future of the nation. He symbolizes the future of the nation. Right? So, uh, Hayabadana does not know what the future has in store right? because he becomes that uh, hybrid post-colonial subject who is disillusioned with the future right? and has lost the romanticism, the, the excitement of the freedom struggle and is the leg legatee of a hybrid legacy right, of the colonial and the indigenous. Right. So, he says that he had actually begged a goddess to make him complete and the goddess appeared very prompt and looked rather put out. She said rather peevishly I thought, why don't you people go somewhere else if you want to chop off your stupid heads? Why do you want to come to me? I fell at her feet and said, mother make me complete. She said, so be it and disappeared. And so, that's the, the goddess Kali makes Hayavadana uh, into a horse, but a horse with a human voice that is condemned to chant or sing only the uh, patriotic songs of the national anthem. Thank you.